You made it. Checked out of office to check into the sweet views of this place where the kids aren't asking for the Wi-Fi. Mom, can we go to the pool? And when you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. The JCPenney Mystery Sale is back for the holidays. Through Thursday, usher in huge holiday savings with our in-store coupon giveaway. You can get an extra 30, 40, or even 50% off while they last. Simply find an associate for a coupon, then peel to reveal your deal. Hurry in now to discover the savings you've been wishing for. We got your holiday. JCPenney. Coupon valid on select styles through 1215. Exclusion supply. Giveaway in-store only. Must be 18 years or older. See store for details. Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason. Today we're talking to someone I recently met, a new friend of mine, Nate Bender. Nate is from Montana, has done some epic stuff in the mountains there. But what we're going to be talking about today is the snowman race. It's a race put on by the king and the queen of Bhutan, the government of Bhutan, to help bring awareness to the rapid climate change that they're experiencing there in the Himalayas. And they do that in a really unique way through a run, a race, a trail race, a stage race where they invite people from around the world to join. Well, it's invite only. And part of the purpose is to do an epic event in a beautiful place, but also to see firsthand what has changed in a really short amount of time and to help spread that message and spread that awareness around the world. So Nate was invited to do this. And it was really cool, very special, very uh, prestigious to be invited to this. It's amazing. It's quite an honor. And you're going to hear why, because he's done some amazing things in Montana and in the American West, just some uh, really cool, fastest known times, some peak link-ups, and is born and raised right there in Montana. And I love his what he does, because he already is thinking this way, because he has a dual master's degree in resource conservation and business analytics. So he loves the outdoors, but understands that, like a lot of us, we can't just love the outdoors and expect it to just always be there. We have to be advocates for it. These places from national parks to state parks to city parks uh, don't just happen. It takes people advocating for them. It takes people having a lot of foresight and saying, hey, places need to be saved and need to be set aside for the enjoyment, not only the enjoyment of humans and for recreation, but also for climate issues. You know, that we, we need trees to grow. We need animals to thrive. We need these places for, for water recharge and whatnot. There's a million reasons why uh, we should protect the land that we use to recreate on. And so Nate, Nate is really interested in that stuff. So anyway, really cool story. And I hope you get as much out of it as I did. So let's go ahead and jump in. All right, folks, welcome to Adventure Sports Podcast. You heard a little bit about Nate in the beginning, in the intro, uh, but Nate Bender, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey, Mason. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, this is awesome. I, I, I'm I'm really excited to talk. There's a lot about you that I'm really interested to learn, and this race is incredible, and also your passions, how they align. I, I just relate so much. I can't wait to like talk to just a fellow marketer and, and someone that's interested in conservation and how it overlaps with adventure sports. But uh, what I want to start with and what I always ask first is where are you coming from today? Uh, and if that's not home, where's home? I'm from my house here in Missoula, Montana. And this is home. Yep. This is home. Awesome. Uh, did, did you grow up there? You, have you moved there? Where'd you grow up? Pretty close, actually. I grew up in a town called Hamilton, which is about an hour south of here, down the Bitterroot Valley here in western Montana. Oh, wow. I'm looking at it now. I don't know much about that area, but oh, cool. Very, oh, what a beautiful place. So you, not far at all. Have, have you noticed a ton of change just in your area growing up? I mean, is that kind of like beating a dead horse at this point? Or, or what, what has changed about Missoula or at least the area you grew up in, in the last, I don't know, in, in your lifetime? I mean, just the influx of, of people, especially in recent years, you're seeing a ton of new people, a ton of new construction, tons of, you know, a lot of an issue that we deal with here that's 
exacerbated in recent years is just how like housing availability and, and housing prices. And I think a lot of the places in the country are are dealing with that. But yeah, Missoula is definitely a hot spot for that in Montana, at least. But as far as like the Bitter Valley and Hamilton where I grew up, it doesn't I mean, yeah, it's like it's it's growing slowly and there's there's more people, but qualitatively it doesn't feel like it's changed that much. It looks like quite this string of small towns right there. And that is the nice thing. I grew up in a very small town and and frankly, not much has changed. I feel like the population has gone up by like 50 people maybe in the last 30 years. So in a lot of ways, some places just remain the same, even though areas pretty close by can can, can be so drastically different. So you must have grown up going in the mountains. I mean, they are right outside your door. Were you in a family that encouraged this kind of activity? Were you out and about in these places that uh, you now enjoy? Or did you have to kind of figure that out on your own? No, totally. I was really lucky to grow up in a pretty outdoorsy family. Both my parents are are super into the outdoors. And, you know, just, just to have that that fit of of interests growing up in, in place. You know, a lot of people grow up, like both my parents grew up on the East Coast. And like my dad bounced around, but like went to high school in Florida. My mom was in New York. They both ended up going to the University of Idaho, kind of both sight unseen. Wow. And have never left the West since, you know, so, but it, but it took, you know, a bit of a journey for both of them to like find their place. So I think about their stories a lot with my childhood and just feeling pretty lucky to grow up in a place that fit what I wanted to do and kind of who I was. It's awesome. Yeah. Super lucky like that. So you, so you were probably, you probably visited the East Coast or their families. Did they go to the Idaho together or did they just happen to meet there? They just happened to meet there. Oh, very cool. Very cool. But it was, it was kind of wild listening to their stories, how they were, they were both a bit like, well, the West sounds great. Like, I'll, I'll go to this university. Like, there wasn't a ton of research <laughs> going into it. But it, it worked out for him. So hey, you know, maybe that that's my kind of decision making right there. It just, yeah. uh, ah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> so, <laughs> not a lot of analytics going on and, 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 and probably information <laughs> yeah. was slightly harder to come by at that point. So you just had to be much more okay with the unknown, I guess. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, it sounds like childhood and life there was probably incredible. And to be able to call yourself a local too, is I'm sure very rare or, or, increasingly so. And it, and it gives you a unique perspective and a unique connection to the land, which is really cool. Yeah. W- when did you start realizing that the mountains and the wilderness and all that was like, it didn't just happen. It's something we have to advocate for and and, and actually work towards. When, when did you start notice maybe uh, getting into some of the interests that you've studied now, whether it be uh, conservation or climate issues? Did you notice that? Because I know for a lot of athletes, it, it it's surprising the amount of folks it just never comes up and never becomes an issue. I, I know for me, it was like, got to the point where I couldn't almost enjoy the outdoors knowing mm. a developer was trying to purchase the land I was on to develop. Or something like that. Did, did did you have a moment like that, or anything that you began to realize? The turning point for me was was in undergrad. I took a class on sustainable business practices when I was studying marketing as my undergrad degree. And you know, you talk about like the watershed moments or the inflection points in life, and that was an inflection point in my life where I was being exposed to to concepts around sustainability or triple bottom line accounting in in business practices and having this this light bulb moment of of thinking man that is what i want to do with my life i want to work on these types of problems i want to understand how i can contribute to a healthier world all of those things yeah so it was it was like second year of college for me was where it really tied like intellectually tied an uh, understanding of like how how business and society interacts with the environment and then you know just on a personal level kind of bringing those ideas over into you know my own adventures in the mountains and and thinking about man I get it it'd be great to to work on things that that help protect these places that I that I love and love to play in oh it's awesome man so so second year of college super formative time 
still a lot of time ahead of you, you know, a lot of time to uh, screw around for lack of a better term and just kind of play around <laughs> in the mountains and just do random stuff. What, what did you begin doing or what kind of direction were you taking to align some of those values? Cause you said it started opening your eyes. What did you do anything immediately or did it take time before you started taking action? Oh man, I've had a super uh, circuitous route to, to get to where I'm, where I'm at now. Absolutely. That is, ab- if, if you didn't, it almost is like you shouldn't be on the show. Like there's no one that has a trajectory that makes sense. That's been on the show. <laughs> it is so good. It feels like the more you talk with people, the more you realize that there's just so many different ways that people end up where, where they're at. There's, there's very few people. It seems like that have this like cookie cutter at six years old, they realized they wanted to be a rocket scientist. And it's just been, you know, an, a, a march to that point from, from there. But no, for me, yeah, I graduated undergrad in 2012 and immediately, you know, I was, I was raft guiding at the time in the summers in between semesters and just like dove headfirst into that. I went and rafted uh, or guided down in New Zealand for half a year and transitioned, you know, kind of like the New Zealand summer up into the the Idaho summer when I was guiding um, in Idaho and just did that. I did a couple other outdoorsy type type jobs where I was just, you know, out in the wilds and, and using my body and, and not much of, a, of my brain for, for a few years, just kind of trying to scratch the adventure itch. And I didn't really know, it felt like for several years I had these, the, the intellectual disposition to, to want to work on conservation issues or work on environmental issues. But I didn't, even even after getting the degree, I didn't feel like I had my niche. I didn't really know how to break into that work and and really kind of get a foothold there. So, did you see anybody doing it well? Anybody that, like whether they're you know well known in the, in the outdoor industry or, or or working on similar issues or or operating with a passion and a cause? Did you have any examples or mentors, well known or or, or, or personal? I mean, more on the like athlete activist side of things. I mean, I really, really looked up to athlete activists like Luke Nelson or Claire Gallagher, you know, on the on the running side, or Tommy Caldwell on on climbing and emerging, yeah, merging their athletics with with their values. But I think more broadly, I I look up to a variety of people in my life that marry, say, having a family and having a career outside the outdoor recreation and athletics or, or you know, or, and, and maybe not at a, at a professional level of, of athletics, but yeah, even in, even in those years when I was chasing the, the adventure itch and, and just trying to figure out what it, it was exactly I wanted to do with my life, I it was always most drawn to role models that had something going on intellectually and something going on with a family and, and it was something going on athletically and with big dreams in the mountains. And it, it was never kind of enough. I, I, I guess I knew that I never wanted to be like a full-time professional runner or a full-time professional athlete. And that's all I ever did. I, I wanted to, to have some other achievements as well. Those people are super interesting when one, it's interesting because there's so many sides to them. It's like a multi side coin. You know, it's not just one, it's not one dimensional. It's more than even two dimensional. It's a lot to process, but it's also inspiring in the sense that it shows you, you don't have to choose one or the other all the time. Like to be the very best, there are definitely benefits to solely focusing like if you're an olympic athlete so you know almost got to be just totally obsessive sure but yeah for for most of us it's much more relatable when folks can balance those different aspects of life and totally agree any anyone that can i mean there's so many folks on this show that i'm blown away that they do what they do but they also have a family or they also have a business they run yeah in a way and uh, we try to target those folks you know tommy caldwell great example he's been on the show is a dad focuses on projects has a bunch of rental properties like all these things he does and that it's like you just you don't hear about all that with an ad with 
one of his sponsors or something, but you, you get to know these people and you realize that, that what they're known for in a lot of ways can be a small part of what they do. It's big or it was big, but now it's mm-hmm. it, it, they're they're they shift and they change. And it's so fascinating to dig into that. It's really important to have the, uh, I like to call them like, like 30 hour a day people, like the people that just somehow have more hours in the day than the rest of us. And they, they really don't. They're just like way more productive yeah. than, than the rest of us. But yeah, definitely. I love like running across people or trying to try to be friends with people that are just those like 30 hour people. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is a great way to put it. I think, I think they just, instead of the eight hours of sleeping, it's the three, the three or four. At, at least that's what it is with me with kids. It's just like finish everything up, get in bed at a way too late of an hour. And it's like, all right, I'll catch up on some sleep. Nope. Kids are up early. Yeah. Just lost again. <laughs> Catch up one day. So tell us about, you know, some of the big challenges you've done, the the FKTs. You have quite a few of those. You've done some pretty impressive stuff. How have you, in my opinion, you know, I'm not an FKTer. I don't pursue a ton. I live in Florida, so there's not a ton to go around. I mean, I could make a bunch up and be the first, but that's not necessarily, it doesn't hold water in a purist mindset. Uh, And you could just get some track star out here that can just blow through any trail here faster than I could ever probably even bike it. So tell, tell us about some of the early adventures, some of your favorites, the, the really impactful adventures you did early on that maybe had a big influence on your life because some of the ones you might be known for might not be the ones that had the biggest impact on you. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that helped make this show possible. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Uh, great question. I mean, that's assuming, assuming I'm, I'm known for anything, which is a stretch. <laughs> no, I mean, I feel like, so I didn't, I didn't grow up running, actually. I grew up playing team sports, playing basketball, playing soccer, and running was always like the punishment for doing something wrong. Oh, yeah. And I was, never, I was never into recreational running. And then, you know, kind of right around where, you know, obviously, you know, college is a formative experience, but you know, right around the point where I was learning more about sustainable business practices, that, that sophomore year of college, I started hanging out with a group of folks that I was playing soccer with, but were also trail runners. And I would try and go out with them and, and hang for, for a day or for whatever. And it just ended up kind of, it kind of snowballed into that. And the more I, the more I did it, the more I enjoyed it. So I didn't get into running until like, like sophomore year of college there. And then, but, but it felt, it always felt like running was an extension of, of what I grew up or what I most liked about running and, and just spending time in the mountains was an extension of, of kind of that thing of just spending time in the mountains and enjoying big days or enjoying a physical and mental challenge. Because I grew up doing a lot of that, like with my mom and dad and, and it, especially my dad, like he and I are wired the same way. And I guarantee like if he got into running in the same way that I did, he would have, would have done a lot of the same stuff, but he, you know, he, he grew up in a different era where it was more about like hunting and hiking and, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's, that's how it's channeled for, for him. But I just enjoy spending big days in the mountains. And so then all of a sudden I I found this new tool where I could run sometimes in the mountains. And then uh, I just feel like that's informed a lot of, of what I really enjoy. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm attracted to multi-day stuff in the mountains where it's a lot of, you know, running on trail where it makes sense, but then going off trail where it makes sense and bushwhacking and scrambling and, you know, all of that kind of good stuff. I, I really enjoy just challenges that, that, um, uh, make you make you work on a variety of different types of movement, you know, and I guess in like summertime mountain travel, you know, or just maybe not summertime, but like not on skis, you know, just that, that variety of movement, the variety of different types of terrain or different ecosystems. Those are the challenges that I, I seem to be, I seem to gravitate towards the most. Gosh, as far as a, an influential early adventure, I mean, it's like I'm, I'm gravitated. I, I, I gravitate towards these high point challenges. You know, it's like high points in a state or high points in a range or in a certain area. The biggest 
one for me was in 2018. I connected all the tallest peaks in Montana in a single push, which was 27 peaks that are, that are over 12,000 feet in Montana. And, and they're all they're all in a single range, all in the bare tooth range in South Central Montana. And, you know, what made it so impactful for me was I, I had the idea to do that after doing the high points in Idaho in 2016 with some friends. And that was really my first big multi-day FKT type effort. We didn't set the FKT, but it was that kind of that kind of uh, energy about it and kind of fell in love with the idea of doing that thing. And then I realized that a similar challenge could be had, you know, right, right on my back, my, my back door, uh, so to speak. And, but it, it took a lot of, of effort. You know, I, I did like two summers of scouting and talking with a bunch of people and just looking at maps forever and ever. Wow. And so I, I just love the process with these kinds of, more, I don't know, like complicated mountain traverse type FKTs of all the groundwork uh, and preparation that goes into the attempt itself is so meaningful, whether it's getting to just call people up and, and see if they're willing to share advice or looking at maps or just spending a bunch of time on the ground, getting to know a place. Like I'd never been to the Beartooths before latching onto this idea. And then I spent I don't even know, hundreds of hours, you know, scouting it and hiking around and camping back in there. Um, because a lot of the route wasn't, wasn't really known or sections were known and other obscure ridge lines connecting peaks were, were not known. And I was going to take a, a, take a weird connection, you know, in between one peak to another that, that wasn't the standard route. So I needed to go scout it. And to me, it just lit this fire of enjoying these kinds of I guess enjoying FKTs as like a creative process or or a, a process that that is is so fulfilling beyond just how fast can you go. And like the the fast part of it is it's just like an additional layer on top of all the other stuff for for me. And I enjoy the way that that all kind of comes together for to make a meaningful experience. That's uh we had Brandon Joy on the show few years ago who did the the highest 50 piece yeah and uh it it was right there in that same uh the range all kind of right there and he 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 was i think we talked like a week or two after that happened he was still shell-shocked like what an experience (laughs) oh my gosh if you only talked to him a week afterwards he probably was having trouble putting words to it he did absolutely i it was very recent after and i and uh it was amazing to hear and i and, and it sounds like yours was just probably a sim- similarly impactful recently though you you've done and and again i've only seen your fkt so there's plenty you've done that it wasn't i don't do anything at that level so none of my stuff would be listed on fastest known time but i did see the glacier national park 10k peaks uh link up that you did uh back in august yeah and what's crazy is kind of what I, I believe this the snowman race or something about it is going to be in the title. And per, folks are probably like, you haven't talked about Bhutan yet. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get into it. But I want to hear you did this adventure, which was at least on FKT was the longest one you've done pretty close to right ahead of this snowman race was I mean, I'm sure you use this as training for that. But like, was it difficult to have such a major, you know, goal or peak ahead with right behind it one even larger in the sense of like in, in a place you weren't familiar with logistically probably just as challenging in the sense of getting there but i don't know you tell me was it like a sigh of relief which one was harder oh man okay where to start so i i was a, i was a late entry to the snowman race luke nelson reached out in mid august or like early august when a couple spots opened up when some other folks had to drop out due to conflicts and so I actually, so I had, I'd, I'd thrown my name in the hat with the organizers, but I hadn't heard like final official approval by the time I went out to Glacier. And so it was actually kind of funny. I sent them an email the night before starting that thing. And I was just like, Hey, I'm going to be gone for a week. I, I'm not checking my phone. I'm, I'm totally out of service for a week. If your answer is yes, I'm in. Don't wait. Don't wait for an answer for me. Like, <laughs> 
<laughs> if, if you say yes, I'm in. I'll talk to you in a week. <laughs> and uh, that actually worked out well. So I actually came out of the Glacier trip to an email from them saying that I was in. So I actually didn't know that I was that I was going to go to the snowman race when I started the Glacier trip. So, Which was like a month later. A yeah, month I think change. like six weeks. Or no, yeah, maybe a month. I, I, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't that far. So you you can imagine like some of this is just the way that the timing shook out. You know, not all of it was perfectly planned this summer. But yeah, I mean, the glacier trip is something again that I've been I've been working towards for for several years. In fact, I wanted to do it with a friend of mine, my friend Sam from from Idaho. We've been working towards this as a as a partner effort for this would be year four now. And we've been stymied for for three years in a row. And then we actually were able to try it back in July. And then we got horrible weather. We got rained and hailed on. And we ended up having to bail uh, on the objective on on day two. And we still spent five days in the park. And we still had an amazing time. But we weren't able to to link up all the tenors and kind of do that original objective. We had a, a fantastic, you know, secondary objective, you know, time of of just spending a bunch of quality time in a beautiful place. Hey, Nate, I lost you. Hopefully this is seamless enough, but uh, Nate lost service randomly. Uh, Not service, I'm sorry. Uh, Lost electricity, lost power randomly. That's actually never happened to me on the, you know, 500 plus episodes I've done. I've lost power before, but thankfully a lot of the stuff I have is on battery and it was just working, but that's, that's wild. Anyway, we're back on to talk about the second half of this conversation, which is the snowman race. And you were, you were just getting ready to mention that and start talking about what that is, how it worked and how you got invited, stuff like that. And then going into detail about kind of the mission behind it. Welcome back, of course. Thanks, Mason. Yeah. Sorry again about that. Okay. So the snowman race was the brainchild of the, his majesty, the king of Bhutan. His idea was to use mountain running as, you know, use, use runners, use mountain running as uh, a vehicle to talk about climate change with the thinking that runners of, of kind of all outdoor recreationalists, runners are, are relatively kind of uh, close to the earth. You could, you could say, you know, we're, we're fairly in tune with the places that we run through, the places that we get to experience. And he thought that that Kind of connection would make for, you know, yeah, a, a natural connection as as messengers uh, of this kind of thing. So we wanted to use sport, to use mountain running, to talk about climate change overall and talk about climate risk specifically in Bhutan and specifically to say some of the more fragile mountain communities in Bhutan. So especially like northern Bhutan. So Bhutan kind of uh, the northern part of Bhutan is up against the Himalayas. And so you have Tibet and China to the north of, of Bhutan. So it's kind of like the farther north you get in Bhutan, the more mountainous it gets and the more you get into the, the Himalayas there. And so you have some of these kind of remote highland communities up there that are facing you know, some of the first effects of climate change around the world. So the route takes takes us through some of those areas so we could see that firsthand and yeah yeah that was the idea so where where so this is really cool I, i'm looking on the home page of the snowman race and it says glaciers are melting polar ice caps are thinning and coral coral reefs which i didn't think would make an appearance uh on a conversation about the himalayas are dying climate change threatens the well-being of all mankind that's a quote from his majesty the king of bhutan how much did that theme feel present in this race? And also how cool to combine adventure with purpose. Cause a lot of times those are exclusive or those are separate. And for you, I'm sure that was just like a, a dream come true. I mean, this absolutely felt like a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. So I was lucky enough to kind of be a late, entry to it. So my friend Luke Nelson, who's also another one of the runners, um, who's a longtime Patagonia athlete and and overall great guy, uh, he reached out in in early August when a couple spots opened up from other runners who had to drop out due to scheduling conflicts. So he thought a couple spots might be opening. 
he encouraged me to to throw my name in the hat and I did that with the organizers and then actually uh the day that I got off of the glacier trip I came back to an email saying that I got accepted so that was a really good day you know coming off of the glacier trip I didn't actually know that I was going to be accepted uh, or that I was going to do this when I started the the glacier trip so it was kind of cool to come back to civilization to uh not only to finish that project but to to this good news so yeah i mean being able to mix mountain mountain adventure or mountain experiences with with some of these values that i i hold dear like talking about climate action like trying to use these experiences to show some of the impacts of climate change whether it's in a far off place like bhutan or to make one thing I know about our listeners is we love our dogs. I have two dogs. One of them will eat anything in the world. The other one, a little more picky. But both of them absolutely love Dr. Marty's Nature Blend dog food. It has zero artificial preservatives, additives, fillers, or anything like that. First four ingredients, turkey, beef, salmon, and duck. It's freeze-dried raw, so it's nutritious, like a homemade diet, and pantry safe. My dogs have been absolutely loving it. I mean, heck, after a long adventure, you know how hungry you get on adventures, especially if, you know, you run out of snacks or something. You put a bowl of that in front of me, I might even take a bite. Shoot, I ain't afraid. I've eaten worse. So there's no fridge, freezer, messy prep necessary. You can store it in a pantry just like a dry dog food. So if you're interested in stepping up your game and feeding your dog something that's going to give it its its youthful vitality, easy on the digestion, softer coat, healthier skin, and make them happier, go to drmartyspets.com slash ASP. That's D-R-M-A-R-T-Y-P-E-T-S dot com slash ASP to get a discount on this amazing dog food and potential adventure snack. Don't quote me on that, though. Live life at your pace. Click the banner or go to visitwilliamsburg.com to discover how. Because here in Williamsburg, life moves at one pace, yours. Here, our waters are splashing and rejuvenating. Our history is for seeing and experiencing. Our theme parks are for riding and sometimes flying. And our great outdoors are yours for exploring and restoring. It's all waiting for you in Williamsburg. Book your trip today and live life at your pace. Venture X from Capital One is the travel card for people always asking, Where next? You earn 10x miles on hotels and rental cars and 5x miles on flights booked through Capital One Travel and 2x miles on everything else you buy with Venture X. Plus, receive premium travel benefits like access to over 1,300 airport lounges. The Venture X card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details. Connections from that kind of place to similar effects that we're seeing, say, here in the U.S. or even even more granular, like here in my home state of Montana, or, you know, you can you can go even farther. That kind of thing is something that I feel like I've been working towards for several years now. And so this was one of the first pieces where I feel like it, it really has kind of come to fruition in being able to to do that, to use these experiences to talk about the value of climate action. How present did that mission feel during the event itself? I mean, very much so. The whole experience was was eye-opening, very, very eye-opening. I mean, we didn't fully realize, I think, the amount of investment that the Bhutanese were putting into this event before we went out there. And I say investment in terms of 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 money, sure, but but time and people and kindness and and their their generosity and i mean uh, in all it was you know it was nine bhutanese runners and 20 international runners and so they're they're putting up pretty much 30 people for three weeks there you know we're getting to go around to different cultural sites like different buddhist temples and monasteries and meet with different government officials, whether it's, you know, people that are helping to keep the race safe from like contingency plans of, you know, medically keeping it safe or have evacuation plans or have the militaries involved to to make sure that, you know, people could get flown out by helicopter if needed or hiked out or in the contingency plans were, were off the chart. 
Um, they did they did that really well. But from the climate side, it was amazing to go out there and see. It, it was like it was like as, as if you came to the U.S. and you had an event like this, and you're meeting with cabinet level officials in in the U.S. and the president and whatever our version of of a king is, the king and queen, and they are all they all know about this event and they're invested in it to to various degrees, whether it's like granularly putting it on. Or like the king and queen, you know, intimately in, involved in, you know, the, the mission of it and, and understanding the, the idea of it. You know, so, so that was kind of like the context that, that surrounded the entire thing. You know, it's, it's very much, it was very much baked in to this entire experience of, of being out there, kind of both before the race and after. And then during, there, there's always some amount of during the race, you're, you're just trying to physically and mentally make it through what it is that you're doing, you know? So, so it's not like, it's not like we sat around and talked about climate action for four hours each night at camp, you know, after, after working our, our, our butts off, but it's, it's baked in at a deeper level. I feel like where you are being, you're meeting people along the way in these remote communities, you are seeing where glaciers are receding and glacial lakes are are forming where there just used to be ice you're seeing how unreasonable it feels to you know be hiking at 18,000 feet in shorts and a t-shirt because it's that warm and it, it feels very deeply wrong so you see examples like that and that's all baked into to your experience over a race like this yeah but what i find interesting about this race is the like how involved the king and queen are at least from like pictures and from like a messaging point of view such an interesting idea to like invite folks to race to raise awareness for something but also do something that that is absolutely epic do you think this kind of idea has legs in other spaces or other areas seems really innovative yeah i mean i think there's a bunch of different forms that this could take and different outdoor recreation communities that that could sink their teeth into something like this absolutely there's no reason something like this should be limited to to running or to bhutan you know it it could happen in a lot of different places in in different forms you know the, yeah i mean the examples i have are are from running but i'm sure it it can be done in other communities or it's already being done i just don't know about it i mean another great example of T- directly tying running into a cause, which in, in this case is also climate action, is like the Takanya trail run down in, oh God, I'm, I'm blanking on if, it, if it's Australia or New Zealand. Australia, I want to say Australia. There's, there's an old growth Takanya forest down there that's being threatened by lots of different logging activities. When And so, and so what the organizers down there have done is created uh, a trail run that goes through that forest and directly pulls in people to experience that place and and to fight for it. So it's like a way of using running as a way to give people that kind of intimate one-on-one experience with a place yeah. and show the value of it. And then also using that running as as a fundraising mechanism. That's too cool to hear because, you know, we, we talk a lot about on this show doing adventure for a purpose. And so a, a common format is doing a long distance trail or bike ride or something, raising money for a cause. And oftentimes I will say, and even personally, anything I've done, it has been to raise money for something not directly associated. So like cancer or for me, it was like building an orphanage or literacy programs, but I'm riding my bike. So there is, it's awesome. And it does great work. And I love it when people do that. But often there is a a disconnection a lot of times. Um, But this it's literally, here's the place you're going to adventure. And here's the reason you're doing it is to protect the place you're actually running from or running through. Yeah, that's really cool. And I'm a huge believer that you have to get out there and see the place before you start to care about it. For a lot of people, there's plenty of people who, who, who have led conservation movements who would never saw those places, Abe Lincoln being one of them. He did so much work and never saw these places himself. But for a lot of us, experiencing it is going to take our enthusiasm to 
do this work to just a level we can't even imagine. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I think that model, um, there's a ton of potential for that model to be expanded to, to uh, like a lot of other ultra marathon events where it's um, really, really tying in the purpose of the event to maybe a specific issue or a specific place. So like just to circle back to the snowman for, for a second, I think what really comes to mind, like a big takeaway from that for me in thinking about how to best communicate this message is to, yeah, I mean, talk about the impacts to places like Bhutan, where you have highland communities whose lifestyles and cultures are are being disrupted, where they're at risk of flooding from these glacial lakes that form when the ice melts, ecosystem changing. I mean, all of that is is happening and it's and it's dire and it's drastically changing their ways of life and ecosystems. But at the same time, I mean, I've, I've also done a decent amount of work in, in grad school as far as understanding like messaging around, around climate action. And, and it's kind of the cold, hard truth that for the most part, people are not inclined to, to care about distant, far off, kind of unconnected problems. It's, it's just kind of, Unfortunately, like I wish it was, I wish that wasn't the case, but it is. And so I think my job coming from this event is to connect that to the people that I'm talking to here in the US or, or, you know, wherever they are, whether it's talking to say people here in Montana. And, you know, last year we had like really high variability in, in our spring snowpack. We had Sorry, and, and like the, in in the melting of it, and some amount of that of that like extra variability in in the temperatures and how fast it came, uh, how fast the snowpack came off was due to climate change, and we had massive flooding around Yellowstone and kind of the southwestern part of the state, flooding that absolutely disrupted lives, disrupted the economics of of that part of the state, and so you know I think the story is talking about impacts in a place like Bhutan in the way that they are incredibly similar and in, in the same to places where, you know, here in the U.S. or here in Western Montana or wherever the audience is can tangibly feel them, right? Because you want to make that, want to make that connection as, as local and as immediate and as tangible as possible, because that's what, that's what drives action. That's what makes it um, so it makes it real for people. I mean, the more, the more we can talk about climate change, not as this abstract thing that's happening halfway across the world at some distant point in the future, but it's happening now and it's happening here and here are the ways and, and yeah, we can connect them to other places in the world like Bhutan, but it, it's happening. It's happening everywhere. And so showing, showing those ways, showing those connections, um, and, and telling those stories, through the experiences of of something like this race, um, I think I think that's powerful. I think that I think that has value. That is awesome. And yeah, uh, thankfully not thankfully, it's not a problem that's only in Bhutan. Of course, <laughs> it's everywhere, and uh, this shouldn't take too much looking to see some sort of impact. And, and the effect of maybe not climate change itself might not be as apparent to everyone, but the causes of it are going to be apparent like development. I know here in Florida, that's a big thing is just seeing land that's gorgeous and pristine and old growth being developed into homes or to industrial parks or whatever, or highways. And that's happening a lot faster than maybe some other aspects of climate change. So yeah, it's, it's happening everywhere. Something connected to this. So it should be easy to, to, to point out. Well, tell me, Tell me about the race itself and how it differs from the things you've done in Montana, things you've done here in the States. I know it's 126 miles f- through some pretty challenging terrain, some mountain passes. I think it averages over 14,000 feet, which is a lot higher than a lot of the the, ch- the challenges you've done. And it tops out at almost 18,000. So what was that like? Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. 
That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Absolutely. I mean, I, so this is my first time really experiencing, you know, trying, trying to do endurance sport, trying to run, you know, or, or trying to, trying to move all day at high altitude. Before this race, the highest point I'd gone to was Handy's Peak in Colorado, which I think is 14,000. Oh, or maybe wow. just a touch over 14,000. And I didn't get a chance to really acclimate before this race. I, you know, I don't, I don't live, I live in Missoula, which is 3,500 feet. I don't have access to an altitude tent or, you know, I can't go, can't go live at altitude. So, yeah, I mean, I underestimated how much altitude would, would make things difficult. I thought, I thought it would just be harder. Yeah, maybe I wouldn't be able to breathe as well, but I would be more or less the same person, you know, just slower. And what happened was I got absolutely slapped down by the altitude. And I mean, luckily I was able to make it through and and to finish. And I wasn't the only one, absolutely. But it was very eye-opening and very humbling in a good way about how, yeah, just how difficult it, it made everything. It was kind of the snowball effect of, you know, I didn't sleep well, so then I didn't recover well. So then I wasn't moving that well the next day. And then it's tough to eat. And then on top of that, you're you're just kind of struggling for breath. Yeah. I mean, y- you know, it's it's funny how you look at the stats of this and compared to some of the other things I've done, you know, it's not it's it's not as crazy stats wise. So it's hundred whatever, 125 miles over five days, 34,000 feet of elevation gain, you know, and like the glacier trip was almost 60,000 feet of, of elevation gain over about the same distance, maybe a bit more. So, you know, stats wise, uh, you could look at that and say, oh yeah, I should, I should be able to do that. You know, that's, that's pretty similar to uh, something I've already done, but the altitude just made it so I was I was in survival mode, you know, kind of from from midway through day one when we got up to altitude through to the end of day four, where our final camp was at like twelve thousand feet, and then kind of coming down from from there once we got below that point, roughly on on day five, and day five was kind of all all downhill. Once we got below that like twelve thousand foot mark, I kind of came back to normal, and I wasn't so much in survival mode. Yeah. It it was uh, it was wild. <laughs> so it, so it's not just a conference. It's like it, it, about climate change. It's actually a very difficult thing to do. I believe only a few people finished, right? I think it's the high. Well, whatever whatever metric they're using, I think it's the highest stage race in the world, like highest average elevation stage race in the world now. Average is over fourteen thousand feet. So I mean that's. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're running in circles on the peak of Mount Whitney or Denali, you're not going to average that anywhere in the States, really. Yeah. So this is the first, I mean, this is the first year, obviously. So now the benchmark has kind of been set with it. You know, some thoughts coming from that are, you know, it was amazing to see how well the Bhutanese did. They were mentally tough. They're physically tough. And, and they just showed what happens when you mix those things, you know, mental fitness and physical fitness and acclimation to, to high altitude. You know, they were, they were in their playground and they, they rocked it. It was really cool to see. And, and meanwhile, the altitude just decimated the international field. I mean, so we started with 20 people and eight finished. Y- you know, it's a fairly like select group of people getting that, that came out for this thing. So it was it was wild to see how much that uh, that affected people. And and of the twelve people who had to drop, Ian Sharman got sick a couple of days before the race. He had had a head cold, and so he he was able to do day one and then had to drop. But he was the only person who didn't drop directly because of the altitude. Everyone else was either either couldn't move quickly enough because of the altitude, or got sick because of the altitude, like got fluid in their lungs or, or had some kind of complications. It was, it was wild. So I feel like I had a mixture of, of luck, you know, just being 
lucky enough to not get a, get affected to to that degree in in perseverance. Wow. That is wild. That's awesome though, to be able to be one of the finishers, one of the few. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'll give like I'll give an example. So day three was, you know, and, and the thing about that place, I think what they need to do for future iterations, because they, they do want to do this again, is maybe change a little bit of how people are being acclimated either before we, we get to Bhutan or the acclimation protocol in the week or so leading up to the race. So we stayed at a community that was about at 7,000 feet and then for four or five days before the race. And then night one of the race is 16,000 feet. So it's a huge jump. And I think that is fairly on the extreme side of what people do as far as getting acclimated to, to high altitude. And so yeah, so maybe like getting the racers to just be at a higher elevation beforehand would would help all of that out. So so that would be helpful. And I think, you know, what's so wild about about out there is that Bhutan does not, or at least this route, does not know what a, like a buffed out trail looks like. I mean, the trails are the most consistently difficult that I've ever been on as far as just kind of uninterrupted miles upon miles of rocks and roots and mud and there, there's kind of no just turning your brain off and flowing down the trail it's all like how you're navigating through the rocks or how you're jumping through the rocks or where to step in the mud so your shoe doesn't get sucked off all of that kind of all of that kind of stuff and so it, it's just kind of a, a mentally difficult kind of race and day three like we all knew day three was going to be the most difficult. It was going to be one of our longest days and it was going to be the longest day at high altitude, like the highest average elevation day, the highest single point. We were going to hit a pass that was just under 18,000 feet. And it was, I don't know, we'll we'll say, we'll say top three or top five hardest days. I've hardest single days I've ever had in the mountains. And we went up this amazing broad valley. Like you're going up this valley, passing this this highland community called Lunana, which is, I think, one of the highest communities in the world. It's like 16,000 feet. And people are cheering, like saying hi and cheering you on as you go through, offering you, uh, there's just one guy on the corner of the, like one of the corners of the, of the community, like with a big bowl of cut apples, just offering us, offering us apples and, and dried cheeses and yeah, getting getting to have these like these brief moments of just amazing kindness and, and generosity and just kind of human connection, you know, in the middle of this thing. And, and meanwhile, you're going up this valley that's at 16,000 feet and you're looking up at these Himalayan peaks at the head of the valley that are eight to 10,000 feet above you. I think those peaks are around 25,000 feet and the scale of the place just just blew me away. And at the same time, as we climb up from that valley up into this next valley, you're getting up around 17,000 feet, coming up this very broad, slow, uh, broad valley with a slow climb, a gradual climb up to this pass. It felt like everything above 17,000 feet was just like I could walk, hike uphill for a minute, and then I would lean on my poles and, and catch my breath. And I was just absolutely hollowed out my body, my legs, everything was hollow. And it was this wild feeling of breath being completely disconnected from, from heart rate. You know, usually they kind of rise in, in tandem, right? But my heart rate would be super low in my breath. It was like I was redlining up these things because you're just gasping for oxygen. And meanwhile, your heart is like, hey, man, I'm not even trying hard, but you just can't, you just can't move fast because you just can't get enough oxygen. And it was like, if I stopped too long, it was, it was really hard to get going again. But also I had to stop every once in a while, you know, every minute, every two minutes, whatever it was to just, just like catch my breath and be able to move again. And so you're, you know, it kind of gives a sense of, of how reduced, at least I got. And so you get up to the top of the pass with, with two other runners and we're in the very 
back of of the entire race. I think this is the first first event, first race I've ever been like, at at the very end, you know, DFL. And like I've I've never been more proud to be to be DFL. Um, get over the pass, and we get maybe a hundred yards down from the pass, and we still have you know a couple hours at least to get to camp. Um, and I was like, oh man, I, I I maybe feel a little bit better, maybe subjectively feel a little bit better, and then just puke my guts out. I think just just the altitude, the time of the altitude. You're not eating that well. I could get a gel down every once in a while, but the appetite was really suppressed. And you're just kind of feeling out of sorts. But it was it was wild where I would just get these waves of nausea coming down from the past the whole the rest of the evening and stop and puke and then be able to keep going. And you know, other other folks are struggling as well. So the three of us ended up maybe hour and a half before we all got to camp, the, the six, I'm sorry, the three of us met up with another group of, of six other runners. So at this point, the field of 29 has been whittled to, I think 18 started that day. So fully half of the field all came in together at nine fifteen at night, you know, so that's 15 hours and 15 minutes elapsed for the day. And it was just wild that that day was 32 miles up, most of it up high at elevation. And it was just a brutal day. It was, it was wild. It was, it was amazing how, uh, how tough that was. Wow. That's wild. That is, I know I keep saying that sounds like quite an impactful experience. And is there anything you can share about like maybe maybe the lessons you're taking away from this, uh, maybe some of the biggest things you've learned and what you're going to implement into what you do now uh, as we close? The, the good and the bad is, is universal. And on one hand, we saw these amazing aspects of human kindness and, and generosity. And, you, you know, sometimes, sometimes with people that you didn't even have a common language with out there. A lot of the Bhutanese spoke English, but, but some didn't, especially in these more remote communities. And so you have had these, these good elements that absolutely are, are like transcend, you know, kind of the world over. And that's amazing. And you also have climate change that is, is also the world over and have these similar effects. And the big takeaway for me is, is trying to show how how these impacts are are happening here or they're they're happening across the world and trying to use an experience like this that opened my eyes to to those connections to to show people that yeah that that these impacts are are happening and say connect that to like my work with footprints where we're trying to which is a nonprofit that helps people um, develop ideas for community level climate action, whether it's small businesses or other kinds of initiatives, but it helps people understand that there are a lot of different ways to connect with the idea of climate action and that it doesn't have to be this kind of hopeless thing, you know, that, that us as just everyday individuals have, have no agency or control over. I think that helping people understand that these impacts are happening, but that we also have, there, there are a bunch of different ways to connect in with this idea of climate action and, and that they can have an impact. And maybe it isn't a worldwide impact, but it's an impact at the community level. I think that's powerful. So those are the connections that I'm trying to make. Thank you for sharing that, Nate. And thank you for being a guest on the Adventure Sports Podcast. Giving this a second go around, I know we had a challenge. Hey, but that's that's life. That's adventure, baby. Things happen that you don't expect. And I will talk about footprints running in the intro. That sounds great. Yeah. I mean, if if people are interested in this kind of thing, it's runfootprints.org. I work with uh, Dakota Jones on this, who's a professional runner with with Normal the new brand that Achille and Jornet started. Yeah, Dakota and I work with a great group of folks and, and the idea is to help people, you know, we focus specifically on, on the trail running community because that's the community that we can speak to, I think most powerfully and, and authentically. And I think there's value in having kind of a, a shared 
a shared activity or a shared kind of community when we're talking about things like how to, how to scale up climate action projects. And what we do is try and provide mentorship and educational resources and connections to people with with different ideas for for climate action and bring them together say so what we've done so far is like a week long camp where we bring together a group of participants and a group of professional mentors from different professional backgrounds whether those are teachers business leaders or nonprofit leaders or professional communicators or athlete activists and you spend the week together kind of building personal connections whether that's you know running in the morning like group runs in the morning and then spending the afternoons kind of putting a business plan to these different ideas for climate action so working on questions of business strategy and marketing and communications fundraising budgeting timelines you know all that kind of nitty gritty stuff that that needs to be put in place to to bring an idea from for, to life you know from something that you're just passionate about to to actually having a roadmap in place to to bring an idea to life yeah awesome yeah that's uh very inspired by what you are doing there and and those retreats are really cool those the, that week long running camp slash just connection that's i mean that has to be such an amazing experience so it sounds like you're taking you've, you're doing a lot of the same things that the snowman race is doing already just in your own backyard and in a different way so yeah, Nate, keep doing the work you're doing because here at uh, Adventure Sports Podcast, you know we we love adventure, but I would say I love it more, a lot more when there's a bigger purpose behind it. Whether w- whatever that purpose is, if it's making the world better in some way, we love to talk about it and love to hear about it. Yeah, I love it. There's we we could talk for hours about that <laughs> intersection for sure. <laughs> we, already, we we have we are um, <laughs> years, hours I'm long. sure. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Nate. Thanks, Mason. I really appreciate the chat. Love it. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. The JCPenney Mystery Sale is back for the holidays. Through Thursday, usher in huge holiday savings with our in-store coupon giveaway. You can get an extra 30, 40, or even 50% off while they last. Simply find an associate for a coupon, then peel to reveal your deal. Hurry in now to discover the savings you've been wishing for. We got your holiday. JCPenney. Coupon valid on select styles through 1215. Exclusion supply. Giveaway in-store only. Must be 18 years or older. See store for details. This holiday season, Peloton's got a gift for you. Get up to $400 off Peloton Bike, Bike Plus, or Tread packages. Choose the package that's right for you with accessories like our cycling shoes, a heart rate band, non-slip grip dumbbells, and more. Peloton, fitness that stays with you. This limited time offer ends December 25th. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. All access membership separate. Offer ends December 25th, 2022. Excludes Bike, Bike Plus, and Tread Basics. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com.